All right, well, welcome everyone. I know we still have many people who are filing into the webinar, but in the interest of time, I wanna go ahead and get started. I know our presenter, Megan, has a lot of great content for you guys. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. It's hosted by the Georgia chapter of HFMA. I'm Laurie Heavey and I'm a Georgia HFMA Education Committee volunteer. Before we get started, I wanna take a quick second to remind everyone about other value adds of HFMA membership and specifically for professional certification. If you go online to the Georgia HFMA website, you'll see that CPAR, Certified Patient Account Representative Course Materials, uh, those materials and testing are available for purchase. You can um, get those materials available. They're available until November 30th and testing concludes December 31st. So when you have time, please be sure to check that out. Here are a few housekeeping items for today. All the phone lines will be on mute to avoid interruptions during the broadcast. Please submit your questions through the question box at any time uh, and I'll coordinate with Megan for her answers at the end of the presentation. I've also, in the chat box, you'll notice that I've um, sent the link for, to download the presentation along with the navigation on the, on the website to get that. Uh, so the presentation will be there and we'll also have other links for um, the recording there later as well. And then this, this uh, webinar is available for CPE credit. And so please be on the lookout for an email. It'll come from me, Laurie Heavey at clearbalance.org. And that will include links to the recording, uh, to the presentation material, as well as to the CPE form, which you can um, self-submit on the Georgia HFMA website. As we all know, telehealth services got a big shot in the arm during the early days of the pandemic. So it's only fitting that today's session uh, focus on CMS updates for telehealth due to COVID-19. Before we get started with our session though, I'd like to take a quick second to recognize and thank our chapter sponsors whose logos you see on the screen here. We appreciate your support. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Megan Beach with Salud Revenue Partners. Megan has been active in the healthcare industry for 25 years with roles in both coding and billing. She is currently the coding manager with Salud Revenue Partners and respons is responsible for all staff hiring and training for the coding and compliance team. Megan focuses on quality, performing quality reviews monthly for all staff. She also assists with coding both physician and facility charges for all of the clients that Salud serves. Megan is affiliated and credentialed through both the American Academy of Professional Coders and the American Medical Billing Association. Megan's also the founder of the La Lafayette, Indiana AAPC local chapter and has served several years as president. So with that, Megan, I'll turn it over to you. We are ready to begin. Okay, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Megan Beach. I'm with Salud Revenue Partners and I am the coding manager. Um, today I'm going to go over information regarding the CMS updates. Um, this is updates to the telehealth, of course, obviously due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what I want you to keep in mind whenever I'm going through these slides is that this is CMS's updates. This is not all the other commercial updates. Um, while a lot of the insurances do um, go and follow the CMS guidelines, a lot of them don't. Um, so please keep in mind anything that I'm talking about today directly correlates to CMS. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the objective today is going to be um, going over all of the CMS telehealth changes, um, different types of services, whether we're talking about audio video versus audio only. Some services allow um, either or. Updates, we're going to talk about dates of service, um, when the dates can go back. There's a lot of dates that um, the update came out on April 6th or April 30th, but they retro dated that information back to the beginning of March. So going over those actual dates of when the actual um, rule or update became an effective is going to be um, something that you're gonna really need to watch to make sure that you're applying the appropriate rules at the appropriate time. Um, that goes along obviously with the effective dates. And then also, if we have time, um, this information, there's a lot of information when we're talking about telehealth. So if we have time, I have on the end of my slides um, some information about the actual testing itself and then also some um, information about the diagnosis. So time, time may vary um, whether we get to that or not, but if we don't get to it, you will have that information on the PDF that will be sent out. 
This is my disclaimer. I get my information from a third party and the contents um, of the presentation are just to be used as guidelines for today. Okay, so let's get into it. So CMS has directed a historic expansion of the telehealth services, basically making sure that the beneficiaries are able to receive the care that's needed without having to travel to a healthcare facility. We want those patients to stay home and stay safe. The temporary change in benefits is under the 1135 waiver, and then the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act. Most of the updates, like I stated before, are retro date um, back to the March 1st, and they're temporary changes um, that are set to expire once the PHE has lifted. Um, the PHE just got reset. Um, July 25th was when the second 90 days expired, and um, the secretary of the HHS did expand that to expire October 23rd, 2020. Now, whether that will be um, pushed back further, I'm sure it will. Um, what will happen is when we literally get up to October 23rd um, or it's 22nd will be when we'll know that it gets, it gets pushed back. Um, and the last bullet I have here is just an information on, you know, how long does the PHE declaration last? And it states here basically 90 days or until the secretary declares it's no longer in existence. So that was just some basic information I wanted to add there. Now, when we talk about telehealth, telehealth seems to be the choice term for COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are other words that people will use, telemedicine, telehealth, um, both interchangeably. For the COVID-19 pandemic, um, just know that telehealth, really audio, video, when they say telehealth, that's what that means and that's their choice term. Now, when we talk about telehealth, there are several different things that we have to look at through CMS um, to determine how we're gonna build this service and does this service qualify. We're gonna have to look at things um, such as originating site and what does that mean? Distant site provider, telecommunication. How are you talking to the patient? Are you talking to them through video? Are you talking to them through just the telephone? You're gonna have to look at what CPT codes can I bill using telehealth and what place of service and what modifiers do I need, um, if any? to be able to build a CMS. So that's what we're going to go over um, each one of these to, to really do a deep dive into what did CMS um, put out there, all the updates and how does it work. I will say before I start talking about um, the originating site to keep in mind that telehealth services are not just for COVID-19 sick patients. They can be any patient. It doesn't have to have any types of um, symptoms or have been in contact with anybody. It's any services that are eligible within the listing that we have. Um, it's not diagnosis related. So it can be for any patients. So originating site. Um, when we talk about originating site, that is where is the eligible beneficiary at when the services is, is furnished. Um, Medicare beneficiaries um, have to be at an originating site in order for it to be considered a telehealth service. And obviously this has been revamped. Um, this is one of the many changes that um, CMS had to make during the PHE. So we'll talk about within the slides, um, I'm going to show you here and I have it laid out to where I can show you where did we start at, what updates have happened and where we've landed at at this point. Um, I tried to make it less confusing by trying to put these in, in each individual boxes, but I really wanted to show you from the beginning to the end as much as possible with all dates in there. Because as you know, we had multiple updates back to back to back to back. And some of them said, we start today. Some of them say, we start back in March. And to try to help um, put that into perspective, I wanted to lay it out here as how it worked on the timeline. And it could be also that somebody in your office is saying, no, we bill it this way. And um, they probably are right at one point. It's just that maybe it's been updated since then. So whenever we're looking at an originating site where the um, beneficiary is at at the time of service, originally Medicare has um, telehealth. Telehealth has always been provided um, service through Medicare. It just wasn't really used as much. 
And the reason being is because they had stipulations on where the patient could be at. The patient had to be at a rural healthcare professional shortage area located either outside of a metropolitan statistical area or in a rural census tract or a county outside of MSA. So that's where the patient had to be at. On March 6th, under the 1135 waiver, CMS stated that the originating site could be the patient's home. We don't want the patient leaving. We don't want them going anywhere. Um, and that's what they stated. Then on March 30th, um, they stated effective immediately that um, clinicians can now provide more services to beneficiaries through the telehealth and that all beneficiaries across the country can receive Medicare telehealth and other communications technology bases wherever they are located at. So think about the patient that maybe isn't at home. They were on vacation and they got stuck where they were at at that time. Um, that kind of allowed for those patients that truly weren't at their home to be seen anywhere. So that's the originating site. The distant site in the providers is where is the doctor at and who is the doctor? Who is the distant site provider? Um, they're the ones that are giving the, uh, performing the service themselves. So what um, CMS has, the top part of your screen here where it says originating, original providers, those providers could perform telehealth services um, always. That's always been the list that, that, that CMS had. Whenever the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March, um, whenever they started making out all of their rules, and changes in guidelines and being under the 1135 waiver, being able to, to allow more services to happen, they never updated their providers. They, they stuck by the original providers. These are the providers that can perform telehealth services. And as you're aware, there's other providers that are not on this list that do provide services that are important, of course, um, to all beneficiaries. So with CMS and getting the feedback, um, what they decided to do on April 30th, they stated that for the duration of the PHE, that CMS is um, waiving the limitations and that these um, requirements expand that types of health care professionals include all of those that are eligible to bill Medicare for their professional services. So that allowed for um, providers like physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, that allowed for them to now start seeing telehealth uh, patients as well. And as you notice here, when I talked about effective dates, um, this is one of them that I wanna point out as stated, this update came out on April 30th and it stated for the duration of the PHE. So they're not stating that if a physical therapist happened to see somebody telehealth wise in March that they can go ahead and bill for that. Um, my understanding of the way that I read this is stating as of April 30th, these doctors or these providers are now added and they can now build telehealth services going forward. So you wouldn't want um, to go back and bill anything inappropriately. So you wanna make sure you're watching those dates if you have those type of providers. So the telecommunication systems, how are we talking to the patients? How are we getting the information across? Medicare um, originally had in their information for telehealth services that an interactive audio and video telecommunication system that permits real-time communication between the clinician and the beneficiary. Telephones, fax machines, electronic mail systems do not meet the definition of interactive and you could not then do a store and forward. So you couldn't record something and then forward it to um, unless you're part of a program in Hawaii and Alaska. Obviously, um, that needed to change a bit when we start having the patients be at their own home. Um, and how is that going to look? So on March 6, they updated it to state that um, physicians could use um, commonly used apps such as FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, Zoom, or Skype for these telehealth services, um, even if the applications doesn't fully comply with the HIPAA rules. So they allowed for the patients to be able to get on these um, sites and the physicians to be able to talk to their, their patients a lot easier. 
Um, they did state, though, however, you could not use any um, public facing platforms, which is um, like the Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok. I'm not for sure how many physicians would actually use that, but they did put that in their disclosure. Um, so now we have the patient at home who's able to um, get online to either a Skype or Zoom meeting um, and be able to see the physician and the physician be able to appropriately see the patient and be able to help them out with whatever their needs are. So they have allowed that. Um, and then another thing I wanted to take note um, of one of the biggest changes um, that kind of happened in, in, the, in between there was the original telehealth that Medicare has always allowed, um, their services were for new or established patients. It didn't matter if you were new or established whenever you look at their telehealth codes that they allowed. They had 99201, 99202s, those type of services. But when the pandemic hit and the 1135 waiver hit, it stated on March 6 that you had to have an established relationship um, with the provider and the patient already. And then they quickly realized that that wasn't going to work. And the last update then on March 30th stated that clinicians can provide services to new or established patients. So I want you to keep in mind when we say um, new or established, it's just not the um, visits themselves as far as like whether you're billing a 99202 versus a 99213, but also this applies to some of the codes and some of the descriptors say that um, they can only perform these particular services for established patients only. And we'll talk about those a little bit later in, in the, the um, webinar today, but um, those do apply, this rule does apply to new or established throughout all of the telehealth services or maybe the e-visits um, e is what CMS calls them as well. And I'll make sure to point that out. Um, even though the definition states established only for this particular time, temporary change, now it will change back, I'm sure, once the PHE drops, um, we, they are allowing them to be new patients as well. So that's a little bit about the background on those particular services. Next, we're gonna talk about what are the service codes? What can I bill as a telehealth if you are one of those providers or you have, you know, you're working for one of those providers that are eligible to bill for telehealth. We need to know what does CMS allow us to bill? What kind of codes are we looking at? So CMS had already had um, a pretty comprehensive list already prior to um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then they added 80 additional codes um, on March 30th. So on March 30th, they stated, we have over almost 200 codes that you can bill as a telehealth service. And some of them that I listed here, um, they allowed emergency department, um, inpatient and subsequent observation and initial nursing um, facility visits, critical care therapy services, um, physical and occupational therapy services. And you can see here, if you put two and two together, these telehealth services came out on March 30th for the physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, those codes were available to use on March 30th, although they didn't allow the practitioners that typically perform those services, physical therapists, occupational therapists and such, to even bill these codes until April 30th. So again, very important to note that those particular providers could not start billing these codes, even though they were part of the um, telehealth services starting on March 30th. CMS looks at it as that a um, physician, a provider, an MD can perform these particular types of services and that's why they allowed them on there. So we knew in March 30th, whenever this came out, that they definitely would have to change the providers at some point, and obviously they did the next month. So then they went on and um, another month went by, and they decided that they needed to expand the list even more. Um, this time, they kind of they kind of mixed it up a little bit for us. Um, not that they didn't already have it uh, enough confusing the way it was. But this time they've added not only audio and video services, but now they've made audio services only onto the list, um, which gave us over 200 codes now to bill, almost um, 240. 
so some of the new services that they added at that time were some eye exams, cochlear implant follow-up, vent management follow-ups, um, behavior health, and some additional rest home visits. So they added some new services that weren't on there before. And most of those new services that they added were mostly telehealth, meaning audio and video services. They still needed to be performed that way. Um, but what they did was some of the services that were already on the listing now shows that they could perform it by audio only. They realized by this time that the set of patients that we're dealing with are elderly patients that they probably don't know how to work a Zoom account. Um, they may not know how to work a smartphone. They may not even have a smartphone. Um, family members were having to try to help, um, but you know, it just, it wasn't working out and CMS understood that. And um, thankfully they, they added some changes, which was much needed. So here I have listed, this is the site that you can go to, to get the telehealth codes, all the codes that can be billed to CMS using telehealth, um, whether it be audio, video, or just audio, um, you'll have a listing here. And what they did whenever they added the audio only part was they made a new column to their um, listing that they already had. So what you see here is you see on um, column A is gonna be your CPT, column B is the descriptor of that CPT. Column C shows you the status. If it shows um, like on this very first one, temporary addition for the PHE, obviously that shows you that that code was not an original telehealth service. It was one that was temporary added. And you'll see that, you'll see that statement. If you see that statement with no um, date after it, that means that that was additionally added March 30th. If you see that statement with an April 30th, then you'll know that that was just added as of April 30th. And then you'll see the next column. It says, can audio only interaction meet the requirements? If you have a yes, beside that CPT code, that means that you can perform that service by audio only. You do not have to have the video requirement um, in order to perform that particular service. So as you can see here, the second line 90785 shows that that particular service could be performed only using the telephone. Um, and a lot of the services allow for that, um, which is really, really nice. Um, for the patients to be able to, to call their physician and get these types of services um, with just using the telephone only. So I would encourage you, if you have not went out and looked, to go look and see what those services are. See if you can now perform it audio. If you've been doing it video audio and it hasn't really been working for you, if you see a yes here, you can bill that the same way that you've been billing it before. One thing that I will stress, and we'll talk about the actual billing of these codes, um, but, what I really wanted to stress on this was anything that you see on this listing from CMS that shows these are telehealth codes, you will need a 95 modifier. One of the um, top questions is you, um, you'll see that this telehealth listing also includes now telephone only codes, which um, was a brand new change to CMS. They've never allowed those codes before but these codes are on this actual telehealth listing. What that means is those telephone codes, which are 99441 through 43, now have to have the 95 modifier because they moved them to this telehealth listing. Even though they're only audio codes, they've only ever been audio codes, they have to have a 95 modifier. I cannot stress that enough that anything on this service, whether you're doing audio, video, or just audio, has to have the 95 modifier. So a couple of updates I wanted to make sure to mention is um, with the previous telehealth, there were a couple of limitations on some types of services and they did release those um, limitations on March 30th. So it was that hospital subsequent visits um, had a limitation of one telehealth every three days. They lifted that to say there's no limitation. And the same with the skilled nursing facility, they limited it to one to every 30 days. Those two were list, lifted as, as well. So that was um, a couple of things that they lifted limitations on that made it really nice to be able to um, still care for your patient. So what we just went over is 
what does each of those services mean, um, originating site, or what does each of those um, categories mean? So now we're going to put it together and talk about the billing of a professional billing and coding. And where we started at, as a professional distance site provider, we started with, um, they had to use the appropriate CPT listing off of that telehealth codes that, that Medicare put out there. And they had to bill with a place of service of O2. And um, it didn't matter that the service was performed in your office or if it was performed in um, the hospital, it didn't matter. You use the place of service of O2. That's what told CMS, hey, this is done differently than a face-to-face -face visit. This is a telehealth visit. So what happened on, um, that, was, that was what we went by up until March 31st. March 31st, the first update came out that said, CMS is no longer requiring you for the place of service of O2. And um, as long as you're not performing any traditional telehealth claims, but we're going to backdate it. We're going <laughs> to we're going to make things a little bit more confusing. So we're going to backdate it with the data service of March 1st. So anything from March 1st and on, if you performed a telehealth service, you no longer needed to use place of service O2. What they wanted us to do then at that time was use the place of service that was consistent with what would have been reported had the service been performed in person. So if you are a provider in your own um, office, normally you would bill a place of 11 service if the patient came into your office. That's the place of service you would use. Um, you also then have to use the modifier 95. Modifier 95 is now what is driving CMS to know that this is a telehealth service and not a traditional face-to-face um, -face visit. And of course, um, the CPT listing is going to be the same as you're still going to have to get that from that telehealth listing. So that was a big change. Um, and had any services been already submitted in that time, you um, would have had to make sure that, you know, to go back and either change them or make sure that your MAC carrier was going to change that information for you. I don't know how much services were really done and billed within that time with everything being so new. Um, but if it was, we, you know, everything needed to be go, go back and, and get changed at that time. Um, with this uh, place of service um, change. They also did a little bit of a change with as far as how are they going to pay the, the, the provider. The original payment has always been that basically whatever the, the current fee schedule is, we're going to pay you the facility rate of that, of that fee schedule. So whether you were a place of service 11 or place of service 22, your telehealth um, payments were based on facility rate, um, the, the fee schedule for the facility rate. On March 31st, they also retrodated that effective back to March 1st and stated that they're going to change um, the way that they're paying physicians and that it's going to be provided at the rate um, that the service would have been in person. So what that meant then was that a physician who is practicing in an office and normally would see patients in their office with a place of service 11 now instead of getting the facility rate they're going to get their regular rate would if they just like they would have if they would have seen the patient face to face now the one thing that didn't really change was for that outpatient provider based clinic the doctor that's billing under place of service 22 he or she is still going to get paid that facility rate so it really didn't make any changes as far as payments for the provider-based physician. Um, it did make a change in how you bill it um, appropriately with your place of service and your modifier. Um, but it really didn't equate to anything for payment, way, payment rate. Um, but it did make a payment difference for those physicians who normally bill with a place of service 11. So what I have here is just a quick example. If you um, were a physician that um, normally bill with the place of service 11, prior to the changes, if you build a level three service, you would have used the place of service O2, no modifier, you would have been reimbursed at the, the facility reimbursement rate of like 52.33. The last update then ups it to the non-facility rate, same, same patient, same services, place of service 11, modifier 95, now you're gonna get 76.15. 
But as you can see in the example for your place of service 22, it remains the same. Um, the physician is still going to be paid at that facility rate reimbursement. So um, that would be the same. But what you can see here is you see a difference about $25 or so in between what the facility rate reimbursement versus the non-facility rate reimbursement. Typically, whenever we perform uh, telehealth services, Medicare is going to pay a professional that facility rate, and then they're going to pay that extra 25 bucks to where the patient was at. So the originating site fee, they would get to, to charge for that, and they would get that $25. With the patients being home, there, there's not really an originating site fees happening. The, the patients can't bill Medicare for them being in their own home. So that's why Medicare made that change. Um, what Medicare did realize after making that change that, you know, the provider base um, is still, he's still at the hospital or she's still at the hospital. They still have clinical staff. They still have supplies. They still have the office overhead. And those things weren't being able to bill. So what Medicare came in and said was the Q3014, which is what the originating site facility fee would have been able to bill, um, is now going to be allowed for the hospital to bill if you follow all these rules and regulations. And basically, um, if the beneficiary's home or temporary expansion site is considered to be part of the provider-based department at the hospital, you could bill under the PFS for the originating site fee. So the Q3014 can be billed. Facility is performing a telehealth service. So I um, unfortunately do not know a lot about the regulations and how it all works. But with this, there was a lot of questions, I can tell you, on the um, after hours calls that CMS had. They had a lot of questions regarding this and how does this work and what do we need to do? And you basically had to turn in um, patients' homes, um, their addresses, as what's part of your provider-based department now. What they've done is they added um, a really good graph. And so I would definitely urge you if you have not looked at this and you are part of that hospital billing to go out there and look. Um, Medicare has a frequently asked questions for the COVID-19. It keeps growing. They keep adding it. They started this in, in, in March and now it just keeps it just keeps getting bigger and bigger with you know more and more questions. But what they've added is this link will take you directly to on page 126 they recently added some frequently asked questions about how can the hospitals bill for these remote services. And there's just a whole graph and lots of really good information that if you need, if you need that, I would definitely say to go to this, this slide. There's 140 um, pages on this frequently asked questions. So if you haven't even looked at it for any of any other services, I definitely would go. A lot of your questions will probably be answered. Um, here. So I just wanted to add this slide to let you know that this is out there. This is a resource. This is a really good resource for your CMS patients for sure. So that's how you would have to build the services. Now, what type of documentation do you need um, in order to build these services? You are going to need to make sure you're compliant. Um, what, what's, what do you need when you're doing um, telehealth services? What time, you know, does some need time, does some not need time? How do you figure all this out? Medicare has came on and said, um, we want you to, to, to perform these services just like you would with any other encounter. You know, your face-to-face -face encounters, you need to have that same information. But we also want you to make sure you're making a statement indicating that this was a telehealth service. Where's the patient at? Where are you at? And are there anybody else in the room? And what, what are they playing the role of? Is the daughter in the room helping with this information or the son or whoever it may be? Um, that has always been part of their um, requirements for, for billing telehealth and it has remained. Um, one thing that they did update on March 30th was stating that the beneficiary consent should not interfere with the provision of the telehealth services, that there must be an annual consent um, signed to be able to perform the telehealth services, but it can be really done at any time. It does not have to be 
necessarily done before the times that the services are furnished. Um, it can be done at the same time and it can be obtained by the auxiliary staff as well. On March 31st, um, this was going well, um, although, you know, a lot of uh, physicians were saying, you know, how do we get our exams, you know, when we're trying to do this video, it's very limited. Um, Medicare realized that that would be something um, that's not able to be done very well, and they updated it. They updated on March 31st to state that documentation for E&M and other outpatient visits can now be based on medical decision making or total time spent same day of service. So uh, what I want to say here is to make sure that this you understand that this line is representing E&M and other outpatient visits. This is not all telehealth visits. This is just these specific types of codes. E&M and other outpatient visits, 99201 to 99215, is what this line pertains to. It's not the annual wellness visit. The annual wellness visit still requires certain, certain um, requirements that does not pertain to the E&M and other outpatient visits. So you would still have to have your limited exam done at that time um, for those particular services. But if it's an E&M and other outpatient visit here um, listed, you can use medical decision-making or total time. What they've done is they've kind of fallen into um, being um, forced, I feel like, to use the guidelines that, that is going to change in January 2021. So if you're not aware, um, AMA has put out that the guidelines are going to change for those particular types of services and that choosing the levels of those services are now going to be based upon the MDM or total time. Medicare decided that we're going to go ahead and start that type of service similar to what we're going to do in 2021. Um, but not completely. Um, so what's going to happen is based on the MDM for the pH for the remainder of the PHE is now going to be the same. So in um, the medical decision making portion in 2021 changes. Um, so they're not going to add any of those particular type of changes now. But what they're stating is that you can pick these level of services based off of the MDM only. You don't have to count your points for your history or your exam. Now they still want you to have the information there, um, you know, to ensure the quality and continuity of care, of course, but you'll want to make sure um, that when you're choosing your information that you don't have to use the three of three for a new patient or the two of three when you're looking at your total record. You could just use the medical decision making and that's the same as normal. The number of diagnoses or management options, your amount or um, risk of complexity of data to be reviewed, and then the risk of significant complications. Those are going to be the same things that you're looking at now. Now, the one thing that they did state is the total time that you could also bill off the of total time. Now, if you're going to bill off the of total time, you can actually use the total time information for the 2021 and you'll see here, these um, bullets represent what does total time spent on the date of encounter mean? Um, it means that if you're reviewing tests prior to the patient um, coming in, which in this particular case, prior to calling the patient or doing the video for the patient, you can use those that time to be part of your total time. As long as it's spent on the date of encounter, it cannot be the day before, it cannot be the day after. One thing that I will um, point out here is documenting clinical information in the electronic health record. We've never been able to count that as time. Um, you can now count that as time. So if the doctor spent another five minutes after talking to the patient on the phone doing their electronic health record, that time can now be considered part of their total time. So it's important to know that you can count the total time spent on the date of encounter. But what do those times mean? So on March 31st, whenever they updated all this stating you could bill on MDM or time, they stated that the times were still being finalized, but they referenced the CMS table of times. Whenever you go into the CMS table of times, they have it all broken out. And um, the, the 212, 213, and the 01002, like those services, they were about the same. I think they may have been even the same. But when you got to the level four and level five, 
things change drastically compared to what was listed under your CPT code descriptor in your, in your coding book. And um, like the 214 was like now 40 minutes or something, it was, it was a pretty drastic jump. Um, so CMS recognized that they had a lot of people questioning, you know, you're not really telling us what the time is and we wanna make sure we're being compliant. We don't want some auditor to come in later and say, hey, you didn't bill these right. Um, so they, re they, they requested more information. On April 30th, CMS came out and stated that the times for the specific levels of service are based upon the time listed in the CPT code descriptor. So thank goodness they, they qualified um, and used that information to, to go off of. So now we know if you spend 25 minutes um, with a patient and you're doing audio, video, and um, your total time is 25 minutes, that would have to be documented in the chart total time spent um, has to be documented if you're going to bill off of that time. If you're not using time, you don't have to worry about putting that information in your system. You're going to be, you know, billing off the MDM, I, I assume, if you're not listing time. But that information would need to be available in the chart note to know that you are billing off of that time. So it's very important to know what guidelines CMS wants you to follow, what time, what, you know, how do you figure all this out? What documentation do you need? The reason why that is, is because we knew it was coming. Um, the OIG work plan came out and guess what? They stated telehealth is gonna be on there. Um, so they've added to their work plan. They're gonna be two different reviews. One will examine the extent to which telehealth services are being used by Medicare patients, how the services compares to being used as a face-to-face -face, and the different types of providers and beneficiaries using it. So they wanna look to see, you know, what do we need to continue on with after this PHE? Um, who's using it? What are they doing? How, you know, how are these services working? So that's really good. The second part is going to identify um, program integrity risk. So you know, making sure you have that information in your chart of what they wanted, it's kind of confusing. You know, they changed it multiple times. Um, making sure that you're covered following those documentation guidelines is what's going to help you um, get through if the OIG asks, you know, and reviews all of your claims, um, making sure you have that information. So it's important going forward um, and also important while you were working through all the changes to make sure you understood those changes. So next we're going to talk about the telephone evaluations. And as I said, CMS added these particular codes to the telehealth listing. So whenever you're billing these codes, they're going to need a 95 modifier because they are now on the list. But kind of back up to where it started at, Medicare's never allowed these services ever. Um, whenever everything came about, they first allowed them on March 31st. They stated they would retro date it back to March 1st, knowing that a lot of patients were trying to do the video and then the video dropped off or they couldn't ever really ever get it started. Um, so you, they didn't want the providers to lose out because they still performed the service. They still had their documentation, but how were they going to bill it at that time? Mm -hmm. So they made it retroactive to March 1st, stating that we can now use these codes and the 994414242 and 43. Um, whether it is five to 10 minutes, you know, it's all based on minutes talking to the patient. And they compared it to some pretty small RVUs and the payment ranges were pretty small, $14 to 41, but hey, it's better than nothing, right? I mean, Medicare wasn't even gonna consider these codes and then they, they allowed them. So um, if you're doing the services, they were going to allow these particular codes. The place of service is consistent with what had been reported had the service been performed prior to the PHE. So your place of service 11, your place of service 22. Um, the one caveat to these particular type codes are that the services may only be performed if issue addressed is not originating from a previous ENM service provided within the previous seven days, nor leading to a follow-up appointment within the next 24 hours. And they also stated that this must be patient initiated. And then obviously your documentation, there's not really any documentation, quote unquote, requirements for these particular codes, besides the fact that you're gonna need to have your time listed. Now the time listed is not total time. 
very important to understand that these particular services are not outpatient. Um, e &M services that were referred to on the time and medical decision services. These are time driven services that's during medical decision um, or medical discussion. So if you were on the phone for six minutes with this patient, you would bill a 99441 period. It doesn't matter that you spend another five or 10 minutes writing in the chart. This is medical discussion time must be included. Um, while there's no documentation requirements um, that I've seen, I would, you know, do it just like you would be doing a face-to-face -face visit, you know, write down what they're wanting, what, why they're calling in, why, why has, you know, what it, whatever is going on, the medical decision making that you had to put behind that um, to be able to cover that. Now, the one thing that I had asked um, Medicare um, directly was I, I sent in a question and I said, what does patient initiated mean? Because I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand what does that mean. And I'm going to slip to the slide and then I'll flip it back. I send in a, a question saying, "What does your definition of patient initiated mean?" I was teaching um, others to to say, like, if you tell the patient that this service is available and they say yes, I want the service, that that means that they initiated that. And I wanted to make sure that I understood that right. And they basically had came back and said yes this is what we are interpreting that to be is that for the services that need to be initiated by the patient the practitioners may educate those beneficiaries so that was one of those whoo, moments like i was telling them right um that is what they mean so that was good information i felt like to have um clarification on so once we move into april um they let us go a whole month um of saying you can use these codes we're going to pay you this little bit of amount but you know um during that time they quickly realize that a lot of services are going to have to be done by phone um, and that the doctors are putting in a lot of time, you know, with these conversations and they're documenting, they're doing things very similar to what they would do on a 99212, 99213, 99214. Those services, they're all pretty much the same. They're just doing it over the phone. So they had changed to make the RVUs comparable to those e &M services. So um, the, the level one visit here, the 99441 would be comparable to your level two established and then um, three and four. So that's what they made the RVU switch to. They also paid, um, the payment range got changed from $46 to 110. So you're going from a $14 payment range to a $46 or even up to 110. That's a big difference. Um, the place of service, again, consistent with what would be reported um, place of service 11 or 22. Now you have to add that 95 modifier because they added it to that listing. Um, even though these aren't video codes, it doesn't matter. 95 modifier has to be listed. And then the same with the seven days um, leading up to or can't, you know, have a, a meeting without um, following the, the patient on this particular one. Again, documentation is going to be the exact same. So very important to make sure that you understand that these services went back to March 1st. So whether you sent in a 99441 and got paid $14 in um, April, sometime in April, whenever they came out with this update on April 30th, they stated, hey, we're going to pay more for these particular services and we're still backdating it to March 1st. So very important to know that those particular services are now um, should be gone back in by your MAC carrier and paid that, you know, that higher rate. Um, so that's something that you definitely want to look at. And right after this slide, I actually have taken off of the Palmetto GBA site um, their timeline, and I'll, I'll show you that um, of when they made those updates and what to expect. But the one thing I wanted to add to here, and this is a newer slide for me, um, I wanted to add this because I get a lot of questions about what if we have a telephone visit and it lasts over 30 minutes? What can we do? And Medicare came out and stated that these particular codes that you see here on your screen could be, could act as um, add-on codes, quote unquote add-on codes to the main code of the telephone service. So the 99441 through 99443, if you build those particular codes, these codes also could be added and that 99441 is now your quote unquote primary code. So this shows you right here, the 99354 is prolonged EM and office or other outpatient settings first hour. 
So this is a, if you look on that telehealth listing, it does say yes, that it can be audio only. So what that means that is that if you have a patient and you're talking to them on the phone and the doctor spends 60 minutes with the patient in total, you could build the 99443 and the 99354. Now, this particular code states first hour, but this particular code, you can report as long as 50% of the time has been met. So that's why I have here report 30 to 74 minutes. So if he talked to them for 65 minutes, 66, 67, 68, all the way up to like, you know, 74 minutes, you're still only going to be able to build those two codes. But you would have to have an at least additional 30 minutes. It can't be my doctor talked to them for 45 minutes, so I get to add this prolonged code on. You can't do that. You would still just be at the 99443. So that's a question I get asked a lot, and that's why I wanted to make sure to put this out there, that you could build it, but it would have to be at a minimum of 60 minutes spent on the phone with the patient. And this is a slide I was talking about um, the, on the Palmetto GBA site. If you went there, you could see that this information is here. And this is kind of giving you a, a, a line, a timeline of what they did, when they were supposed to have the information done, and what happened. So as you can see on March 13th, it started off saying the, the um, CMS instructed them that they needed to make the updates in 30 days. A couple of days later, they came back and said, okay, we're going to give you 60 days. And then on July 2nd, um, your, um, your carrier, Palmetto GBA, had made some services um, adjustments. And then on um, August 11th, which was yesterday, yes, um, they stated that it would be complete with all adjustments. So I, I did not get on the site yesterday. Um, I don't know if this information has changed. I took this information just like, I think, at the end of last week or sometime last week. Um, so I would say if you have your Mac carrier and you haven't seen any adjustments, I would be questioning that um, and seeing why you haven't seen any of those payments adjusted or um, any, you know, if you're still getting denials, why is that happening? Because it says here that they have updated and made those payment, uh, you know, updates into their system. So I know we're running short on time and I don't want to go too much into these, but what I am going to say is that these particular services, um, that we're talking about next on these uh, few slides, whenever you're looking at them, they're virtual check-ins. These are services that are not um, quote unquote telehealth services, but these are services that Medicare allows. Medicare actually has these codes as of last year, they've always been allowed. They're, they're a little bit different. Um, these are the ones that I wanted to point out that um, most of these say established patients, that they have to be established, but remember that that new or established update is going on right now. Um, so you can perform these particular types of service. They're not face-to-face -face encounters. They're services um, that um, the patient would have a brief communication with the physician um, and then lead into um, possibly just a you know, quick phone call back or whatever it may be. These particular services are not on the telehealth listing. They would not need modifiers, and I have that here. The place of service would be where you normally would bill from. This particular code, um, I do get questions on this. It's very comparable, this G2012, very comparable to the 99441, where it's saying five to 10 minutes of a, of a medical discussion. Um, this particular service does not have to be performed only on phone. It could be through like a portal or things of that nature. But what I would suggest, due to the increase in payment for the 99441, if you're performing a five to 10 minute brief communication with a patient over telephone, I definitely would bill the 99441 over the G2012 because the payment is going to be a higher payment. And it's and it's, it's the same service. I mean, since they added those particular codes, it really is the same service. There's nothing shady about that um, as long as you're doing it off, over the phone. So um, just be aware that this particular code is here and it will be used even past the PHE. It's a code that can be used. Um, and it likely, um, 
the G2010 is the same way. It's a little bit different as far as this is one where the patient could um, send in some blood sugar numbers or pulse ox numbers or a picture of a rash and submit it through email or send it to the physician. The physician then would, would, would have to reply back within 24 business hours to the patient. But these are services that also are able to be billed as virtual check-ins. No modifiers needed again and the place of service would be the same. Um, so due to time restraints, I am going to, I'm not going to be able to get to the rest of the slides, but hopefully you'll have a chance to look over these um, virtual check-in type slides. I've put enough information here where I'm, I hope that you'd be able to, to understand what they are and um, be able to go through them. And then um, here at the end, I have the different types of testing for the actual COVID itself, who can use it and when could use it, um, the, the time dates. And then um, also here, um, collection of the specimens, that's usually a big topic on how do we collect those particular codes and um, the antibody testing I added. And then here's some information about the actual testing and diagnosis itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up. Um, I know, like I said, I'm running a little bit over, um, didn't get to all the information, but Oh, telehealth has so much information, um, so many changes, so much information to, to put out there. So hopefully this will help kind of guide on what you need um, to look for, watch for in your billing system, make sure you're getting the appropriate um, payment amounts for those ones that, you know, Medicare kind of changed multiple times. So did I have any questions? I'm sure I probably have a few. <laughs> you do. And wow, Megan, this is an information packed presentation. Thank you so much for all the detail that you've gone through here. Um, I know I've had a, a chat chat a back, back and forth with you guys a little bit. Um, the presentation should be uploaded to the Georgia HFMA website uh, shortly. Um, I've sent it over, so hopefully it'll be it'll be in the within the next hour. And definitely you'll have it in your inbox, your email um, by Friday for sure. Uh, so let me get to the questions here for you, uh, Megan. Oh, okay. check the web. A lot of <laughs> a lot of requests this, for your presentation, Megan. Oh, uh, so, so again, please, you guys, uh, just indulge us with your patience a little bit longer. It will be uploaded shortly. Um, let's see another question here. If a patient is brought into our office and it is in a different room than the provider for whom for whom is in the same building and services performed via audio and video, do we bill for telehealth using the 95 modifier? That is a no. Um, on the frequently asked questions, this question is even actually on there for Medicare. It states that if the doctor and the patient are in the same building but in different rooms, you would still bill the service as they are face-to-face. -face. So you would still bill like that level three service, place the service 11 with no modifiers. It would still qualify as a regular face-to-face -face visit. Okay. And if we are um, point of service 22 billing for a facility and the provider provides a telephone only call, 99442, can the facility bill uh, Q3014 if all other aspects are in place with CMS? Yes, CMS actually stated on one of their calls, and it could possibly be on the frequently asked questions as well, um, CMS stated that any service that is on the telehealth listing, which now includes telephone codes, that if you were billing with the place of service 22 and everything's in place with all that um, following the provider-based billing um, requirements, that you could bill the Q3014. So if you're a provider-based biller, um, per, the provider, the professional is doing a telehealth, or I'm sorry, telephone call, Q3014 can be billed by the facility. Okay, great. And I just remind everyone, we, we have a minute left. Uh, if you do have a question for Megan, please enter it in the Q&A box. I will be sure to ask her. And in the meantime, as we're waiting to see if there are any final questions, I want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar today. And of course, Megan, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Just a ton of detail here for sure. Yes. Our next webinar is August 26th, and it also focuses on 
uh, COVID with enhanced techniques for providers facing COVID-19 challenges. So be on the lookout for Georgia HFMA emails with more details and registration links. And again, as a reminder for today, uh, what you'll receive in an email from me is uh, on Friday morning will be links to the presentation, to the recording, today's recording, as well as the, your CPE form, which you can self-submit on the Georgia HFMA website. And um, Megan, I'm sure you can see it here, but you're getting tons of accolades here for your presentation on the oh, Q&A. Thank you, thank you. Coding is my passion. So <laughs> whenever this happened, I was like, I gotta get on this. <laughs> Well, you definitely have, and it, sh and it shows. So thanks again for sharing your expertise, and thanks, everybody. Uh, no more questions, so, and we are at the top of the hour. So thank you again for your time. Everyone stay safe, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you so much.